Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to worship. I'm Pastor Nathan Keith at Trinity Lutheran Church in Laramie, Wyoming. We have a great gospel lesson today. And for most people who've gone to church a lot, they know this text. It's the text where Peter walks on water. Not for a long time, for a short time, but he actually still walked on water. You see, it's a wonderful story about Jesus inviting Peter to do what Jesus was doing, and for a while, Peter believed. And isn't that how we operate so often in our faith, where Jesus invites us to, to lead alongside of Jesus and to walk alongside of Jesus? But our surroundings, the way we look at the things around us, they take us away from doing what Jesus asks us to do, and instead we sink. And so I welcome you to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. And let us all not sink in our faith, but sink deeply in the grace of our God. Because in that moment, Jesus reached out and once again saved Peter. We worship. So blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God, and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
The Lord be with you and also with you. We pray together. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. At Horeb, the mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord and shall prepare for God a pathway. A reading from Romans, chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down? Or, who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel this morning is from the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, Why he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why do you doubt? But they got into the boat, and then the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. O grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, when we read this text together, many of our good Christian folks that we have here, hearing this will gloss over a little bit because they know the story of Jesus walking on water. And they know the story of Peter sinking. We know this story well. I remember if you have any knowledge of the Greek, Peter's name actually means rock. Rock. So if you knew your Greek really well and you were reading the Greek New Testament 1,500 years ago, you would be reading the story and you'd know Peter means rock and you would know that if Peter stepped on the water, he would sink like a rock. You would know the foreshadowing of the story. But there is a verse that we need to reread. There's a verse we need to reread. After Jesus dismissed the crowd, the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray. Not to play, <laughs> but to pray. Now we are pretty lucky here in Wyoming. We live really close to the mountains and I just got to go up there Sunday afternoon as well. I love that I get to live so close to the mountains. But I wonder how many of us go to the mountains, go up to the mountains to pray. I mean, so often we go up there to play. And I have gone up there to play as well. Well, let's switch gears for a second. Let's look at the work ethic. What do you think about the work ethic here in American culture? Well, time and time again, I hear that our work ethic is pretty strong. In fact, I run into members of my congregations that I have served here and also the other two that have shared with me, members have shared with me that they don't take vacations in their lives because their vocation and work is too important. And they said this as if it was supposed to impress me. And I think they also said it to assume that I shouldn't take vacation either. You see, Jesus, we believe, just did ministry for three years. I've been doing ministry for more than three years. You see, it was right after he was baptized, and and he was killed three years after that baptism. So his ministry was three years. And throughout the Gospels that we have that recorded his ministry, they say time and time again that Jesus went to be by himself to pray. You went there to stop, to reflect, to listen, and to pray. And every time Jesus goes up that mountain to pray, the disciples were doing something different. They weren't praying and resting. They were busy doing. They were busy doing. 
And what happens when we are busy doing and we, an enco- we encounter a very stressful situation? Well, when I deal with a situation when I'm busy, I enter into that situation with little resistance, with little patience, and a whole lot more anxiety. And this is where we enter the experience with the disciples. In the hustle and bustle of ministry and listening to Jesus and to to processing the crowds and, and trying to engage all these different things that Jesus is doing, there they were caught. Caught in a busy schedule. Caught. And I don't really recall any text that says that the disciples went up to the mountain to stop. And as we hear in our gospel today, they were far from land, and the wind was against them, and they were freaking out a bit. I'm sure they were exhausted doing ministry all day, then trying to cross the sea at night without Jesus, and the wind is up, and it's against you, and there are waves. But Peter, remember we, the one we call the rock, who saw Jesus actually wanted to do what Jesus was doing. And Jesus said, sure, come on. I mean, that's the beautiful thing that Jesus was inviting the disciples into because Jesus wanted the disciples to do what Jesus was doing, to preach, to look after those who are outcasts, to heal those who are in deep suffering. And what happened? Peter actually walked on water. He actually walked on water. But, but soon Peter noticed his surroundings. I mean, certainly after a couple of steps, Peter was probably had the hair on his back rising up going, wow, this is incredible. I'm actually walking on water. But Peter sees the waves, he feels the wind and the spray of the sea upon his own face. And his surroundings start to convince him that he should be in despair and not in this moment of great joy. And don't our surroundings do such things? I mean, our surroundings have so much power over us. And remember this kid's movie called Nemo. Remember the scene when Dory the bluefish and Nemo's dad, that they were trapped in the mouth of a whale. And remember that scene? Dory, as the water was sloshing away inside the whale's mouth, Dory was singing and having a blast, and Nemo's dad was doing the complete opposite, and he was freaking out. Dory had a peace that Nemo's dad could not even find. And as followers of Jesus, we can have that kind of Dory peace. Well, I'm guessing most of you have had a moment in your life when you were either Dory or Nemo's dad in that movie. And as a pastor, I've experienced both Dory and Nemo's dad with people on their deathbed. I've experienced people who are just like Dory facing a very difficult situation and they were still singing and still full of hope. It's incredible when you see someone who knows they're going to die and they are full of peace, they're full of God. And I've been on the other side as well for those who are like Nemo's dad, for for people who are on their deathbed and they know they're going to die. They're mad, they're yelling, they're worried, they're scared, and they are angry. And you must remember that most people that I get called to as a pastor are professed Christians. So I wonder if it's a matter of our faith. I mean, Jesus says to Peter, you of little faith, why do you doubt? I mean, so often in our Gospels, the disciples are called you of little faith or you are uh, you of no faith. And so often we see them interacting with Jesus and the ministry of Jesus in some pretty odd and unhelpful ways. 
And those who are angry at death, I mean, they're angry for so many reasons, right? And that's okay to be angry. And sometimes they're angry at the loss of time with loved ones. But sometimes it's because they don't believe God was gracious. And sometimes it's because they are scared that they don't believe in God's righteousness, in God's grace, the event that happened on the cross and the resurrection. But even though all the moments where Peter was a stumbling block to Jesus, and Peter was a stumbling block to Jesus, I mean, all the times, through all the times, Peter wasn't following Jesus well. Through all of that, Peter still walked on water. He still walked on water. He still believed. He caught a glimpse of what the kingdom of God could do in his own life, that it could do the impossible. But the power of my surroundings are too strong. You see, I love water. I've been on the edge of water many times in my life, and thinking about this text where Peter walks on water, and then I take that first step to the shallow water. And my knowledge of knowing what floats and what does not float keeps me from believing. And so many things in my life try to keep me from believing in God and in Christ. Things like the evil we see and experience, the hate we have towards minorities, the small fights we have on social media to diminish one another, the violence we see even in our own community, the statistics of rape and abuse of women. And notice I haven't even said COVID-19 yet. I mean, people are saying to me all the time they just want life to get back to normal. But going back to normal, it's full of things that still bring hatred and abuse and suffering. And all these things have me sinking further into despair. But thankfully, Thankfully, we have a God who is not affected by our culture our, or by what God sees. That God continues to do what God continues to do. That is, that God continues to reach out and grab us by the hand and to catch us like God caught Peter. So you of little faith today, yes, you who are listening, keep on trying to walk on water. Keep trying. Keep on trying to be faithful. To be faithful in your surroundings that take you away from being faithful. I mean, today the world needs the boldness of Peter to actually try to do the ministry that Jesus was doing. And the world also needs the vulnerability of Peter who still needs a Savior. So keep on risking. Keep on risking and loving. Why? Because Jesus has already reached out to catch you and to grab you by the hand. And Jesus says these words to you yet again. Do not be afraid. It is I. Amen.
with the whole world, let us share our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and health by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For your whole church throughout the world, O God, give courage in the midst of storms, so that we see and hear Jesus calling, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Especially during this crazy storm of COVID-19, we especially pray for the church in Madagascar, that many of our church leaders and many of their parishioners are dying from COVID, that may we follow Christ wherever he leads, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray for the well-being of your creation, protect waterways and forests and lands and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. God, forgive. Forgive us as human beings, for we haven't been kind to the gift of your creation. And help us to sustain the gift of these resources. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray for the nations all around this world and also our nation and also our leaders, our governors, our commissioners, our president. That God in you steadfast love and faithfulness meet and righteousness and peace come together. May nations in conflict know the peace that is the fruit of justice and the justice that is the path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, everyone who calls upon your name will be saved. So accompany all those who are lonely. Hear the voices of those who cry out to you in anguish. Support those who are frustrated in their search for an affordable place to live. And we pray for those who are suffering this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we humbly thank you for the gift of our congregation. That as we gather this day, however we gather, that we know we gather in your name. That we pray for those who are new to this community, for students and teachers preparing for a new school year, for those struggling with an unexpected hardship. And God, we ask that you would supply us, supply us all with the generosity of your grace so that we can truly have life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all, and also with you. Please share signs of God's peace with those in your homes.
Once again, we come into this time of Holy Communion, and I hope you've been joining us for Holy Communion as we navigate this time together. Holy Communion is a meal during the Last Supper that Jesus, during the Passover, took this meal to bless his disciples during a difficult time, during a difficult journey. So this meal also blesses us during a difficult time and during a difficult journey. So please take out your bread, your wine, or your juice. Have that on your table. And join in this gift, this sacrament of Holy Communion. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So please take that bread and that wine that you have on the table to take that bread and to take a piece and to share it with someone next to you or even if you're having communion by yourself and to say these words, body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. And then to take a small thing of juice or the chalice of wine and to share it with yourself or with all those who are around you in your living room or in your tables and to say, blood of Christ shed for you, blood of Christ shed for you. And so now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Strengthen you and keep you in God's grace, now and forever. Amen. So Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, keep you in his light and truth and love, now and forever. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. song above earth's lamentation. I catch the sweet though far off him that hails our new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth,
Savior liveth, once though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth, no storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since Christ is Lord. God, you 